Hello, everyone. Welcome to another thrilling Science Sunday. You might want to turn the microphone for the auditorium, the volume down just a little. I feel like it's right on the edge of uh, cracking into feedback. That's, that's maybe, yeah, that sounds better. Does that sound better? Okay. All right. So for 10 years or so that I've been doing Science Sunday, my habit has been to talk to you all about other people's ideas, um, whether it's quantum mechanics or relativity or abiogenesis or uh, cosmogenesis, etc. cetera. Um, typically, I talk about some of what I think are the most interesting and accurate ideas regarding how the world works. I'm going to mix things up a little today, uh, do something that I'm unaccustomed to doing and you may be unaccustomed to hearing, and that is tell you about my own ideas. I am not a physicist. I am not a working scientist. Uh, I make my living through information technology, but I'm an avid learner and reader, and I've tried to keep up with my uh, scientific knowledge and education over the years. and. Um, you know, distilled some of what I've learned and synthesized some of the uh, insights I've gained from others into what I call uh, toy models. And I'll tell you more about what toy models mean as I go through this today. I'm going to start by reading a kind of an edited excerpt from my recently available book uh, you can get on Amazon. And uh, I'm going to read through this and then we'll launch into some of the examples of toy models for uh, understanding reality. I can tell that you're the kind of person who likes knowing things. So am I. Acquiring knowledge is a lifelong passion for many people. How do we acquire knowledge, though? Now, I'm not going to delve far into cognitive science, psychology, or philosophy, not because of lack of interest, but largely because of lack of time today. But I think it's valuable to brush up on some of these topics. First, let's consider how knowledge gets into our heads. Using our senses, we apprehend information from the outside world and fit some of it into models within our minds. The information may come from witnessing natural phenomena, watching and learning from another person, listening to some music, riding a roller coaster, reading a book, or any number of other experiences. Uh, let's see, is everything okay with the AV? All right. After apprehending new information, we then compare it to pre-existing models we have about the world. Among other things, these models allow us to set expectations. If we apprehend something unexpected, it can really get our attention. At that point, we might decide to build a new model for the stimuli, or we might instead choose to adjust an existing model to a greater or lesser extent. Such model building happens at a furious pace when we're youngsters, but it tapers off as we age. It seems to me that for some people, the ability to build new cognitive models has nearly vanished. In any case, enhancing or building mental models is an activity critical to our survival. If we had a bad model about and er, uh, a model about something or uh, error-prone expectations concerning the natural world surrounding us, it could have consequences that range from the inconvenient to the fatal. Thus, it's important to build accurate mental models of reality. This is a topic I'll return to after a bit. But first, I want to take a diversion into some terminology that I like using. You might have noticed that just now I switched from talking about knowledge to talking about information. Are these two terms synonymous? Not 
necessarily. In many contexts, I think it's useful to distinguish between them. I'm a fan of something known as the D-I-K-W pyramid, which traces a sort of continuum or chain or hierarchy where each layer builds upon the prior one. The layers of the D-I-K-W pyramid are as follows. Data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. I prefer to call the D-I-K-W pyramid the hierarchy of epistemology, since each of the layers addresses a set of issues in the philosophical study of epistemology, which concerns itself with the ways and means of gaining and evaluating understanding. Intuitively, you probably recognize that wisdom is in some sense involving more complex or sophisticated mental processes than those associated with just information. But what are these different things? Can we define them more rigorously? I think we can. First, let me do so in terms of cognition, then I'll relate this to the physical world that exists outside our minds. Finally, I'll try to tie them back together. Data comprises a set of symbols. They are entirely symbolic constructs, standing in for something real and ideally measurable, or something imaginary. But they're always symbols. It always involves a translation from the symbol to something else, a translation into an alphabetic character or several, a musical note on a treble scale, a few digits of a number, a nerve impulse or a series of timed electrical potentials and gaps representing zeros and ones. We can imagine all sorts of schemes for transmitting and sorting data. Think about smoke signals, semaphore, Morse code, and other sorts of data transmission. Consider the use of books or optical disks for data storage. One of the insights this leads us to is the fact that data can be transformed from one encoding system to another. Data, i.e. symbols, are always used to store and transmit information. Although not all information comes to our senses as data. More succinctly, data conveys information. In this regard, information might be considered the lower most, most natural level of the hierarchy of epistemology, with data being only some human constructed means for managing information. Nature provides endless sources of information from tree rings to light from distant stars to the orientation and composition of crystals locked in Earth's rocks and countless other examples. I think this is why the terms data science and information science are often conflated. The two almost always go together. If data exists without information, then it's bereft of meaning and significance. Thus, information is data put into a relational context. Information arises in nature from the thinking and perceiving and, and from thinking and perceiving, whereby we deliberately correlate data symbols with a context. This is the beginning of model building, which I'll get to in a minute. The next layer in the hierarchy of epistemology is knowledge. I prefer to define knowledge as a comprehension of causal relationships. Knowledge is reserved for minds as it entails the representation of real or imagined things within a framework of interrelated concepts wielded by a consciousness. Consciousness, furthermore, is a capability of brains. At least at this juncture, all brains capable of consciousness are biological, though that might change. For now, I think it will suffice to say that knowledge about what happens in the world and how it relates to one's survival is essential to every living thing. Bacterium are programmed via molecular storage and molecular signals to move toward some environmental stimuli and avoid others. 
Higher order plants and animals also experience attractions and repulsions based on sensory inputs and how these inputs comport with pre-existing frameworks for interpreting and surviving within the world. But it's not appropriate to say that bacterium are conscious. Consciousness, for the sake of today's discussion, involves the ability to manipulate data and information and plan actions such that intentions and outcomes are optimally aligned. This requires something brain-like. Indeed, the successful implementation of such conscious thought is the essence of wisdom. In my opinion, wisdom is a two-faceted gem of the epistemological hierarchy. The first facet involves planning. Wisdom entails the ability to use knowledge to accurately predict the likely outcome of one's as yet hypothetical actions. Furthermore, by deploying wisdom, you can decide on a course of action that's most likely to bring about some desired or intended outcome and avoid actions unlikely to do so. The decision might be made in an instant with enough experience or it might require careful deliberation. Notice that this does not imply wise actions are synonymous with virtue or high moral character. They certainly can be, but virtue and morality are things a person can be wise about. They're not a prerequisite for wisdom. The other facet of wisdom applies to looking back in time instead of forward. The wise person can look at a historic outcome or a partial chain of causation and correctly, or at least plausibly, deduce the cause and effect occurrences that led to the observed outcome. In both cases, wisdom encompasses the deployment of knowledge to deduce the nature of complex arrays of outcomes. It's either aspirational or retrospective. Now, beyond wisdom, I think there's room for one more layer in the hierarchy of epistemology, insight, or perhaps ingenuity, or aha. Insight entails the ability to look across arrays of causal relationships and spot commonalities, opportunities, and synergies. Ingenuity invariably leads to surprise because it generates a framework for understanding connections between systems, models, and sets of knowledge that were previously overlooked or unrecognized. Anytime we try to understand something, including especially things that exist outside ourselves and our impulses, we cannot help but build mental models. You have a model of the way a day works, from sunrise to sunset. You have a model about how a work day is different from a leisure day. You have a model of your spouse, your friends, your adversaries, and strangers. You have models about whole groups of people, likely a biased and oversimplified set of models. As these models come closer to perfectly describing reality, and as this fidelity is corroborated by a community of experts, the models qualify as scientific models. Recall last time I spoke about an asymptotic approach to perfection in our models of science. This is a representation of that. I now want to share with you some little models I've developed over the decades to help me parse the world I perceive. Some of these models are intended to insist with codifying knowledge. They help me understand some of what I consider to be key relationships between the way things are or between the ways they interact. Other models are, I hope, useful for encapsulating a bit of wisdom. Ideally, they whittle down a lot of extraneous information and knowledge to arrive at a sharp understanding of the most important causes, effects, and possibilities. Finally, I hope that you deem these models somewhat insightful. My insight is a simple one. It entails borrowing a few notions from models used in physics. <laughs>
Let me explain an old physics joke. A farmer brings a cow to a university and says, I would like you to build a cow milking machine for me. The chemistry department takes a look at the cow and says, well, we can create a vat of chemicals that will melt away the cow and leave nothing but milk. Would that work? Well, the farmer doesn't particularly like that because that leaves him without his milk cow. So he takes it over to the mechanical engineering department who contrived to build this loud steam-powered mechanism that rattles and hums and roars and seeks to extract milk from the cow. And the farmer says, this is going to terrify my cow. She's not going to make any milk anymore. Well, he decides to try something modern, so he takes it to the electrical engineering department, who proceed to hook electrodes up to the cow and shock her to the point where she uh, emits some milk. Well, the farmer knows that that's not a good way to treat his cow, so he gives up on the electrical engineering department. Finally, he takes her to where some of the smartest people are supposed to reside, and that's the English, I'm sorry, the physics department. And in the physics department, he meets a professor who says, oh yes, this is easy. All we have to do is to assume that the cow is perfectly spherical and frictionless. So that's the way a physicist might solve a complicated problem. They whittle away at some of the extraneous information, like the fact that cows are hairy and kind of oblong, and instead concentrate on some essential factors and try to model those. When considering the physics of a system, scientists like to pick out the essential, the essential changeable parts. These are called, variously, degrees of freedom, or state variables. For example, a moving particle has three variables in the x, y, and z dimensions to describe its location, and one to describe its location along a continuous timeline. It might also have three other variables to capture information about its movement or momentum along the x, y, and z axis in our three-dimensional universe. So a particle can be described by six or seven degrees of freedom, although it's not really free to move through time in other than a forward constant manner. So that's not necessarily a variable degree. After enumerating its degrees of freedom, these are then bound, bounded or constrained by some imposed conditions, such as putting a particle in a box or in orbit around a star or freezing it to near absolute zero. These are some examples of scientific models, mathematical encapsulations of some of the laws of nature, geometric or geographic models, climate circulation models involving Hadley cells and feral cells and polar cells of circulation around Earth, islands of evolution, populations separated by space or time or oceans. There are rule-based models in science Younger fossils and younger rocks are on top of, um, should be older, older rocks. Unless, right, there's an intrusion somewhere. One gene leads to one protein. That was a model for a long time in biology, microbiology, since been proven to be kind of erroneous. Two species cannot coexist if they occupy the same exact niche in ecology. Bad money drives out good money. This is Grisham's law from uh, economics. There are many psychological models about complex things like human emotions and tailing things like revenge, fairness, rage, etc. Anyway, guided by this method of reasoning, I've tried to identify some of the key state variables, if you will, of systems and situations we all encounter during daily life. These are necessarily simplified models. They're what are called toy models, like the spherical cow. Unlike most physics models, they aren't mathematical. So you won't need to solve equations bounded by constraints. But I hope some of these ideas of mine help you refine your models about some things that are relevant and true in our world. So here's an example of what I call 
zero dimensional or point models. These are things that might be considered factoids about your state of being. Are you happy, wealthy, conservative, young, straight, Caucasian? Are you alert? I hope so. Are you introverted? Are you liked? Are you smart? You'll notice that your assessment of your own attributes may differ from somebody's assessment of your attributes from the outside. But there's still value in recognizing your state of being, as it were. Here are some rules. These aren't just points that describe your current state, but there's some rules that I've come up with to help interpret information and causal relationships in the world. It often takes extraordinary circumstances or effort for an adult to change his or her mind. We can all probably think about examples when that may be true. And if I go through these too quickly, by the way, um, since this presentation is up on YouTube, you can always come back and refer to it later. And also, I want to leave questions at, uh, time for questions at the end. Almost everybody is almost always doing the very best they can. I think it's good for us to try to keep that in mind. I don't think very many people are trying to do a bad job at their lives. People are trying to do the best they can, and it behooves us to acknowledge that. People always use what they have to get what they want. This is the first part of what I've deduced as my own view of the laws of economics, if you will. This is the first of the three laws of economics that I've created. People always use what they have to get what they want. Rule number two, they always want more. Rule number three, they will act in accord with the first two rules until they're stopped by something. Maybe they're sated, maybe they're full. If you're having dinner, you always want more until you're full. If you have money, you always want more until maybe you have enough, or maybe you feel embarrassed about having a surfeit of cash. I don't know. Something will stop you or not. So I think these are ways to think about economic behavior. You know, there's that old adage, teach a uh, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll feed himself for a lifetime. I add a rule to that, or a, 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 an idea to that. If you pay a man for a fish, he will drain the oceans looking for his fortune. Another rule that I think I've observed in life, most anger originates from pain. If you find somebody who's angry, Pause for a moment and ask yourself, why are they hurting? Before you ask, why are they angry? Here's some insight I gained from reading some books on psychology. It's much easier to be self-critical in thought than in word. This is one of the reasons that debates between opposing views held on a stage are not typically about the people on the stage convincing one another that they're right or wrong. It's about the audience. Psychologists have shown that we're much more willing to change our minds in private than we are to uh, take back or renounce or alter a view we've expressed in public. Most of the time our minds are changed in private. Keep that in mind when you're arguing with people. Give them intellectual food to allow them to go change their mind in quiet. Pay attention to nominative versus operational evidence. What do I mean by that? Well, if somebody cares about something, they could say, I care about that. If somebody really cares about something, they'll show up. People vote with their feet. 
And related to this is the concept that I call an operational know-it-all. An operational know-it-all is a person whom you can ask, do you know everything or nearly everything? And you can be assured that their answer will be, of course not. I don't know everything. I don't even know close to everything. And yet, many of these same people, you can ask nearly any question, and they will have an answer, and it will be right. I consider those people to be operational know-it-alls. They behave as if they know it all, even though they don't, for social reasons or whatnot, they don't necessarily admit it. Another rule, fitting in with a group, especially of peers, is far more important than most of us realize in our daily lives. So these are some of the rules that I've discerned from reading and observing life. And maybe you'll find some of these useful, or maybe you'll disagree with them. But you probably have your own rules that are part of your own mental model. All right, let's move on. Now let's get a little tiny bit mathematical or physical. You'll notice a bead sliding along a line. I call it the venerable bead. So this bead can trace out where you exist along a one-dimensional spectrum. Are you content or are you depressed? Are you wealthy or are you poor? And you can read the rest of them up there, right? Are you intellectual or emotional? Are you gay or straight? So some of you might already be picking out a problem with this kind of model. It's fairly limiting. It wants to put these characteristics at one point along a one-dimensional scale. Another, um, another example of one-dimensional scales is, are you long-term oriented or short-term oriented in your thinking, in your goal setting? I think it changes from time to time, depending upon your goals and the strength of those goals. Do you want to save for retirement or do you want to have an extra dessert? And it's usually not that simple. Do you want to save for retirement or pay for your child's college. Sometimes these choices can be very challenging. But I think we can enhance these simplistic one-dimensional models by thinking about two-dimensional models. For example, are you a liberal or are you a conservative in terms of your political philosophy? maybe also bleeding into some of your ethical philosophy about the ways to treat other people. Well, what if in some contexts you're kind of conservative, in other contexts you're kind of liberal? Maybe you're liberal about human rights, but conservative about financial issues, etc. So recognizing that you can exhibit characteristics of both tendencies simultaneously is what elevates us into a two-dimensional model about how you or somebody else can be. You can be some of both, or you can split the line, split the difference at a 45-degree angle. This is just plain thinking, two dimensions. All right, here's an, what I consider one of the more useful examples of how representing a model of human sexuality can be valuable. Instead of thinking about a line that goes from heterosexual to homosexual, such as represented along the bottom, think about a plane where a person can be oriented along or have characteristics or um, appetites along either or both axis. And one of the benefits of this kind of two-dimensional model is you'll notice that that green arrow, its length is changing. What that means is that you can 
get some qualitative sense of the relative strength of a person's sexual um, identity or uh, level of a, uh, attraction or motivation. Motivation is the better word. The strength of the motivation that um, sexual issues or attraction issues has in one's life, for example. We may know people for whom um, sexual attraction and sexual relationships is relatively unimportant, and we know, might know people for whom it's very important. That corresponds to a different length, or m what mathematicians call magnitude for that green arrow that's moving around in that plane. So this helps us think through this concept with more finesse than just a bead sliding along a line. It helps us gain a better understanding of the nuances of human behavior and identity. But I don't think this is just limited to, um, oh, I want to talk about this for a second. When I, when I first gave this presentation about a year ago, um, one, of, one of the participants said, well, there's also gender identity mixed in with ideas of human sexuality, right? And there's male to female. So you can kind of think of a three-dimensional space. But I think one of the things you, you have to be careful about is that the magnitude of that uh, arrow in three-dimensional space is no longer as meaningful as the magnitude of its, I'm going to use a technical term, projection onto the two-dimensional plane. That's the white arrow there in the three-dimensional picture. So it's the, it's the length, it's the magnitude of the projection of that arrow onto that same two-dimensional plane that can still inform us about the strength or the motivational um, power of uh, sexuality. But that may be completely independent of one's gender identity. But still, it might be a useful model for thinking about human sexuality. All right, let's roll our own vectors. Those, that swinging green arrow is also known as a vector in a plane. We can think about other examples where we can take things that are typically represented by a polarity between one extreme and another and a sliding bead, and we can represent them two-dimensionally and I think gain some further insight. Think about each of these in the context of A and B. Can you be content and depressed at the same time? Maybe. Might be fun to think about. Can you take this notion of being on a line somewhere between content and depressed and instead blow it up into a two-dimensional plane of existence such that you can be a little of each. Maybe you're content about some things, depressed about others. Can you be wealthy and poor at the same time? It depends on how you measure it, what you count as being wealth, wealthy. Are you wealthy in your connections? Are you wealthy in your ability to rely on your friends, to have a safety net, to have a life filled with rich experience? Or do you have a lot of financial wealth but live in emotional poverty? Conservative and liberal can be represented potentially on this plane, young and elderly. Some things about you may be youthful. Some things about you may be very mature. Female and male, black and white, alert versus unfocused, introverted versus extroverted, gay versus straight, intellectual versus emotional. Think about any dichotomy that you are presented with and try to think about it instead, whether not necessarily that it'll I, I don't guarantee you that it'll fit in a two-dimensional model, but I invite you to think about it as a two-dimensional model and see if you can extract any additional insights. Anytime somebody hands you a polarity, throw them on two different axes and think about, could you be both? Could you be a little of either? What if you're all of one sort of thing and not any of the other sort of thing? What does this mean about other people? Could they be different than you? So I like to use this toy model to think about things that are presented as polar opposites. 
there are other slightly more nuanced use, uh, um, situations where you can use this. In morality, there are two broad categories of moral um, calculus, if you will, of, of the formulas for thinking through morality. One is a rule-based formula. It's called deontological, for those who like words with more than two syllables. So a deontological moral system is one that is based on rules. Thou shalt not, or thou shalt, right? Those are rule-based moral frameworks. And then there's outcome-based moral frameworks. What will happen if? Greatest good for the greatest number. Optimizing personal liberty and personal choice. Those all entail assessing the outcome of a decision or an action. Can we represent those on some plane? Do all of us, to a certain extent, follow some rules because of our society or our disposition, but in other cases, we're more outcome-based? Political, freedom versus equality. Many of us in this building, many of us in this community might immediately say that freedom is very important. Others might say that equality is very important. Do they come into conflict? Can you have one without the other? Can you have both at the same time? Are these Properties that lie at the extreme of a line where you can have either freedom or equality, or do they exist in a plane where you can have some or a lot of both? I'm not trying to give you the answers. I want you to recognize that there's a way to think about this that might be more helpful than just thinking it through with words. Socialism versus capitalism. We hear about that a lot. Um, the political left wants to demonize capitalism and capitalists, while those on the right want to do the same for socialists and socialism. Is there a mix that's possible? I suspect most of us know definitively that the answer is yes, but too many people treat it as a bead along a line going between socialism and capitalism. And instead, if you think about it as a vector in a plane, it enriches your thought and communication and analysis regarding this complicated topic. Now, you can certainly think about a two-dimensional model for things in science, like time versus space, plant versus animal, planet versus dwarf planet, Etc. Now you can also do three dimensional models, right? You can think about contexts where you usefully need to consider three things that can all change independently. This is a model I came up with a few decades ago about what I call disposition. It occurs to me when thinking about the disposition you have vis-a-vis -vis someone or some institution or some polity that there are three particularly important considerations. One is similarity or commonality. How much do you have in common with the thing that you're establishing a relationship with? or the person you're establishing a relationship with. Similarity considerations can be important. Trust, I think, is probably the most important. Do you trust your government? Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust your coworkers? Anybody or any institution that you're developing a relationship with requires a consideration of trust. And then there's compatibility, mutual benefit, your relationship with your employer is based upon 
mutual benefit. You get rewarded for your contribution, and they get the benefit of your work and insight and knowledge. But I think nearly any time we have a disposition vis-a-vis -vis another, we can think about that disposition in the context of these key factors. Like the spherical cow, these don't encompass the entire universe of possibilities and factors that go into enriching and describing a relationship. But I think that these are some of the most important and that we can benefit from thinking about specifically these three. Remember, it's a toy model, right? It's not intended to be a definitive calculus. It's not intended, intended to be completely comprehensive. This is another one I like, another three-dimensional model. Um, Carl Sagan Typic, uh, uh, famously had what he called his recipe for a baloney detection kit. And that's the idea to say, you know, d d does that even seem reasonable? You know, to recognize cognitive biases and fallacies, to be aware of them, to be on guard against them. That, for me, is just one aspect of an enriched intellectual life, being possessed of a good baloney filter. There are two others, I think, that are helpful. One is curiosity, and another is intelligence. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, without naming any names, about three people I've known in my life. This is true. I knew a, a, a person who had an excellent baloney filter. Pyramids, power, Aliens building Stonehenge, crystal energy, a lot of pseudoscience did not pass through this person's baloney filter. I think that was commendable. This person was also smart. He knew a lot about quite a bit. But his curiosity was moribund. He had essentially none. He thought he'd he seemed to behave as if he'd learned all he wanted to learn, he'd rejected all the nonsense that he could encounter, and he was sated. Right? I think that was sad for, the, for my friend. To live a life where you think you've made it and you no longer have curiosity, I think, is, um, well, it's, it's just sad. I knew somebody else who had incredible curiosity about everything and very smart. And boy, did he like space aliens and crystal energy and aromatherapies and, um, or what am I talking about, the oils, the uh, essential oils and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that don't pass scientific rigor as being relevant to our real world. So he was curious and he was intelligent, but he lacked a baloney filter. I really knew a third person who had a really pretty good baloney filter. Doesn't really brook nonsense. Pretty good level of curiosity, but not very smart, right? So my proposition to you is that you can look at the people you know or the leaders you encounter, and think about them in this context to try and come to a better understanding of who they are, what motivates them, and how they think. And maybe that will guide your decision about your disposition, which we talked about a moment ago. Remember, there are aspects to mental acuity that this doesn't capture. It's a simple model. It doesn't consider things like grit, which have been assessed to be extremely important. You know, your ability to stay on task and follow through and work hard. That's not represented by this model, but I think it's possibly still useful. This is another one of my favorites that I, I admit I came up with a couple decades ago, probably when I was uh, starting my graduate studies in political science. 
Um, I was thinking about existential threats. Right, an existential threat is, it's either you or me, bub. Right, that's an existential threat. And it occurred to me that the strategies for dealing with an existential threat generally fall into three different categories that can be brought to bear simultaneously. One is you can assimilate, the other is you can annihilate, and the third is you can isolate. Think about any conflict you can dream up from um, history or interpersonal relationships. These classic conflicts that I list here on the slide, think about how assimilation has played into these conflicts. Think about how attempts, sometimes sadly successful attempts at annihilation have played into these conflicts. Think about how many walls have been built to isolate when faced with a perceived existential threat, I think nearly every response that is leveled to try and cope with that threat entails one of these three, some version of one or more of these three actions. You can assimilate, you can annihilate, or you can isolate. Yeah. Yeah, so the question from the audience is, what about containment? Um, I hope this is not just me trying to backstep into making my model work, but I think containment is a type of isolation, right? You try to keep them separate from you. You try to contain them in a region. You make their territory. Right, yeah, and that's a kind of border, right? It's a kind of barrier. Uh, disposition can have negative characteristics. So right up until now, I've been showing you a simple three-dimensional model. Now let's make the three-dimensional model a little more complex. Let's think about similarity, trust, and compatibility. Well, can you have negative trust? Sure, you can distrust. Can you have Instead of similarity, can you have like an anti-similarity? What would be a word for that, right? Dissimilarity or difference, yeah? And compatibility, you can have incompatibilities. So you can go into the negative territory for some of these three-dimensional models. And then I think this is really useful. This is an idea I lifted from Einstein's special theory of relativity. This is called a world line. If you think about a particle orbiting a star, it traces out an ellipse or a circle. But if you replace the z-axis, the up and down axis in this picture with time, then that particle or planet, as it orbits in a circular path will be spiraling through time, right? This is the world, it's called the world line of a particle. Notice that it changes over time and the change through time is the important concept here. I believe it's relevant to consider that disposition can change through time. Your level of trust, your level of compatibility, your level of um, mutual aid can change through time. Your disposition can change through time. Countries that were once friendly and trusting of one another can become distrustful and vice versa. This is not just about interpersonal relationships. It's about relationships between any entities capable of forming dispositions. Think about your status through time 
in some of these other models, maybe your gender identity, or maybe your, um, your, your feelings or attributes of wealth versus poverty. These are not just static attributes of who you are. We are dynamic, changing, changeable beings that interact with a complex world. And it's not typically useful to think about ourselves as occupying a point in a space of dispositional possibilities. We are dynamic beings and we travel through life. And as we travel, the contexts with which we surround ourselves change and our world lines evolve. And now, for those of you who are mathematically inclined, you can take this idea and extend it to higher dimensions. In statistics and other branches of mathematics, there are multi-dimensional factors, right? Doing statistical analysis, one of the jobs is to figure out how many different independent variables there are that affect the system. Our visual ability to model these hits a limit with three dimensions. But there's no reason, if you feel comfortable with it, that you could stop at three. You might discover for yourself that there are models you can build where considering four independent changeable factors is important, or five, or 10, or more. The moral of the story is, I think, something that this fellow encapsulated well. He said that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And so that, I think, um, motivates us to create models that are simple enough to be useful and appropriate, but not so simple that they're limiting and constrain our choices and opinions about the world and others. And that's all I had for today. I'll have some time for questions and discussion. Thank you. Those, yeah, thank, those of you online, there was thunderous applause. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, did you find that useful? Do you have your own ideas? Do you disagree with anything I said? Do you, you, know, do you have your own models that, that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, we, we have somebody in the audience who said that, uh, that uh, it, it, it corroborates with what he has thought over the years, but maybe stated a little differently. Yep. Uh, yeah, the outcomes for chemistry, yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, so the, uh, we have an audience member, uh, Joanne, who says, um, if I can uh, try to summarize it, you tell me if I get it badly wrong. As we get older, our models of the world, reality, science, other people, etc., we develop, we, we gain enough corroborative evidence, or in some cases disconfirmative evidence, that we whittle away at it and make our models pretty good. But young people are still flailing around. They don't necessarily have models that work well. Um, 
one of the ways I've talked about that in the past is pigeonholes. When we're young, we're building pigeon coops. We're adding on, you know, we're adding on boxes and categories and whatnot all the time, furiously developing, you know, new ways of thinking and categorizing, collecting ideas. But as we get older, I think we spend more time trying to shove something into a box we've already built. And we're not as eager to build on to it, right? So I think that there are benefits to gaining age and experience and wisdom. And I think there's also benefits to the creativity and um, lack of stubbornness of, of youth. Um, not, m many of you parents will disagree with the fact that youths can be stubborn, uh, but... <laughs> Oh yeah, isn't that great? Well, so Joanne further elaborates to say that as you get older, you don't get as embarrassed about changing your mind. I, I don't know. I, I can think of people, certain people, certain, certain people in certain jobs who will not change their mind no matter what, right? I mean, changing your mind is a sign of a flip-flopper, right? So I don't think it's necessarily something that comes along with gaining decades, but, you know, as we get older, we do tend to care a little less about peer pressure and fitting in. You know, we have our own style. We are who we are. So I think in that regard, you're, you're on to something that's a, a truism about human psychology, that we're a little more, um, a little less concerned about what other people think. And if we want to change our minds, that's okay. Yeah, John. Yeah, the world line. Right, particularly the, you know, between the young and the old, where you said it's a short term or long term. As you get older, you know, <laughs> you're looking short term most of the time now. You're not worried about accumulating wealth because you've already done it. Yeah. You're not worried about building a career you already. So you kind of get in the comfort zone, and if you have all the old people making the rules, it's not fitting the model that the young people want. Right. I mean, need. Yeah. So you've got to be careful with that. Exactly. Oh, I, I, I could not agree more. So John, uh, John Farmer tells us that, you know, your perspective and one's perspective in life changes as you go through the phases of life. As you're an older person, you've probably accumulated um, much of the status and the wealth and the, and the, and the uh, creature comforts that you aspire to. But a young person is still struggling uh, in, in certain contexts, just to make ends meet in this, you know. And so they have, people have very different perspectives. And I think one of the points John raises is when you have people who are comfortable and, um, you know, uh, set and well-developed in terms of their opinions and whatnot, and they try to make rules for people in different generations who are coming at the world from a different context, that can cause all kinds of frictions. Is, am I... Am I getting that right, John? So, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, one of the things I feel that plays into that is we should always be very careful when we, want to, when we pretend that we have sufficient wisdom to make choices for other people. If it's a poor person, if it's a minority person who's oppressed or bias, uh, who is a victim of bias and bigotry, I can't pretend to know that person's life and priorities well enough to make a decision for them. Uh, and that applies to many contexts as well. Of course, the climate right now is global warming. The old people don't care. Like, I don't care what's going to happen in 30 years. I won't be here. Oh, interesting. And the young person like, wait a minute, you know, I want a livable world. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. John brings up the point about young people tend to be more passionate about climate change. You know, they're going to have to live here for another you know, 100, give or take a couple decades, years, right? But, you know, mature folks like us, we may only have two or three decades left or, or one. And so for many of us, there's not as much of an existential threat around the concept of 
global climate change or global warming. And Right, yeah. and the resources. Yeah. All the resources that there is, they don't want to spend all their money for this. Mm -hmm. For the young people who don't have the resources that they say, if I don't have this, I'll have nothing. Right, yeah, the people that tend to be established and mature, both in age and outlook, um, want to spend their resources, uh, their time and money, et cetera, and political capital on something uh, that more directly impacts their life and isn't so much forward-looking for subsequent generations. That kind of myopia is common in the human community. Any other comments? Yeah, Cindy. Could you take your mask down? I can't hear you very well. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, uh, Cindy says that uh, she liked the slide that had, as one of the three axes, this notion of a baloney detector. And how is it that people that are smart or curious can still be crazy? You know, etc. So thinking about those three axes can help. Cindy and maybe others among you to uh, parse those situations better. We have somebody online who says, um, where does negotiate, integrate, communicate, accommodate, et, et cetera, come into play in the world of existential threats? Thank you, Peter, that's a great question. My opinion about that is that they're all in the direction of um, assimilation. I. I think an argument can be made that accommodation is a fourth variable in that space, a fourth independent direction. Um, one of the things I learned when I was studying political science is that the word tolerance is negative, has negative connotations. When you tolerate something, you don't like it, and you would rather it not be there or not affect you, but you tolerate it. And when I learned that tolerance had a negative connotation, it persuaded me further that assimilation and um, mutual acceptance is far more preferable than mere tolerance. So I would put that acceptance somewhere in the category of assimilation in my three-dimensional model, but maybe it's important enough a separate consideration that it could be a kind of fourth axis of available consideration in existential threats. It's subsumed within the set. Yes, I like that. All right, well, we're at time today. Thank you all for tuning in, and those of you who showed up, we'll be back in a couple weeks. Dave, uh, my husband, will be talking about issues around Halloween. Uh, science and a little bit of history about Halloween. So thank you all. See you soon. Oh, thank you. <laughs>